Greetings and happy World Aquatic Animal Day. I'm Jennifer Jacquet. I'm at the Department of Environmental Studies at NYU. It is uh, early March. Thank you for allowing me to film this talk in advance. And I'd like to talk about the issue of octopus farming. So let me pull up my talk. So last year um, was a curious year for octopus because we had this incredible film, My Octopus Teacher, that won an Academy Award and, um, and really swept uh, national and international attention. And at the same time, we have um, an, heard announced at the end of the year that um, a company will build the largest octopus farm um, in history and begin the mass production of octopus vulgaris, the same species featured in, in the film. And it's not like my octopus teacher was the first time to capture our imaginations. Um, octopus have really risen in the ranks of fascinating animals um, and have received a lot of popular attention, especially for how they behave and interact with um, individual humans in an aquarium setting. And we have Simon Montgomery here featured. She befriended um, a large uh, giant Pacific octopus in I believe the Seattle Aquarium. She wrote about it for a book. And then there was um, the issue of Inky the octopus who escaped from a New Zealand aquarium, made its way back to the ocean and again, captured our imaginations and even had children's books written by Simon Montgomery um, as a result of this escapade. And of course, we know this is part and parcel to octopus intelligence and cognition and individual personalities. Not every octopus is an escape artist, but some are, and they're quite difficult, in, in fact, to keep in captivity for those reasons. But what my octopus teacher did that I think was really unique and special was it visited Octopus Vulgaris, um, an individual, a, a, a woman of, of a female animal, uh, on her own terms here in South Africa, in the natural world in which she lives, natural setting in the intertidal zone. And that is very special um, because you have to immerse yourself in her environment and see her on her terms. And that is clearly something we were wanting. And it's no surprise as a result of this remarkable feat, um, of course, with um, Craig Foster being able to spend all this time in the water with her, capture so many and compelling images and behaviors uh, and including octopus play, that this film what it becomes one of the most watched films during the pandemic and wins the Academy Award for best documentary uh, feature. Now there's a part in the film that is a little odd where Craig Foster talks about going into the scientific literature for octopus vulgaris and looking at, you know, what he could learn about her. And actually, if you do that, you find that octopus vulgaris is very one of the first scientific results is about the aquaculture potential for this animal. In other words, the ability to mass produce these animals in captivity for human consumption. But that is not what Craig Foster focuses on. He decides instead to talk about, again, topics of personality or cognition, um, safe spaces away from basically a, a political angle. But the truth is there's a lot of research on farming, uh, including octopus vulgaris, the common octopus species. So we have used the film quite a bit. Um, this is my colleague, Becca Franks. Uh, we're wearing Do Not Farm Octopus shirts and speaking about the film, my octopus teacher, to a crowd in, in Southampton at the art, the art Center there. We've used the film as a as a catalyst to talk about some of the issues, uh, moral issues facing octopuses, including octopus farming. And um, and we see that as you know a, a little bit of a missed opportunity with the film itself. Although I think the directors had their own view of of what would you know uh, achieve the widest audience for the movie. 
But the truth is, in many ways, what faces octopus vulgaris is a good analogy for what is happening globally with aquaculture. So what we've seen since 1950 is that capture fisheries have leveled off or even have started declining in many places, despite additional fishing effort. And so that means we we have more boats on the water, we have better fishing gears, but we're not able to get more aquatic animals out of the ocean for human consumption. And what has um, led to the boom in seafood availability and aquatic species sold around the world is the rise of aquaculture, both in inland waters as well as marine waters. You see this rapid growth since really the 1980s um, in aquaculture, and it is one of the fastest growing food industries out there. At the same time, we know that the general patterns with aquaculture is that aquaculture growth is unsustainable, that we are putting more and more species into production that require being fed, for instance, meaning we have to go out and fish aquatic animals to feed to these very aquatic animals that we're growing. We're farming carnivores, and that's something we don't do on land. Um, at, on land, at best, they're omnivores. When we feed them animal products, things generally go kind of wrong, although a lot of pigs and chickens do eat a, a portion of fish meal to help grow quickly um, in confinement as well. So the percentage of non-fed species is declining over time uh, that we're putting into production. And then in general, this growth is made up in primarily fed species. Ones again, that we have to go out and fish, they call them lions and tigers of the sea. We have to go out and fish aquatic animals to feed to these, to these species. So that is one of the many reasons that octopus farming is unethical and a, and a threat to the food chain in the 21st century. Octopuses are carnivorous. They do not have the enzyme to process a plant-based diet. And as a result of that, we have to fish to feed them. And that just doesn't make good ecological sense. But there are a lot of other reasons, of course, that octopus farming is unethical. And we took a framework where we were interested in, in the ecological impacts, the environmental side, the animal welfare side, and the issue of food security, combined this framework to make a case against octopus farming, which was announced in 2014 that it would be the, the next big thing. So there had been a bunch of research, as I showed earlier, into the possibility of of um, octopus farming. And now there are some experimental farms and there are threats that there will be a true blue commercial farm opening um, this year or, or next. So why are octopus so uh, ripe for farming? It's because they're very fast growing. They have short lifespans and there are very uh, obvious luxury markets for the product that would come from octopus. The companies have also argued that these would create jobs. Of course, any new industry would. And the farming has largely been stalled, not because of any moral qualms, but because of the behavior and life characteristics, like life history characteristics of octopus themselves, where they're cannibals um, with one another. There's a dependence on live food, and it's been generally difficult to close the life cycle of octopus vulgaris. So again, we took this framework and we made the case against octopus farming in 2019. These are my co-authors on the article, um, Becca Franks, Peter Godfrey Smith, and Walter Sanchez Suarez. And we, again, on the grounds of the fact that they are carnivores, the fact that it's very difficult to provide a good life for octopus in captivity, and the fact that octopus products have not been shown to be a real um, product for food security, have said, this is a terrible idea. 
So just to reiterate, um, because octopuses are entirely carnivorous, we have to fish crab or squid or hake in order to feed them. And oftentimes, as I mentioned, they like that bait or prey to be live. So that's an, a challenge to, to growing octopuses in captivity, and especially for commercial production. And as a result of them being carnivorous, there's a lot of um, pollution associated with octopus farms, which are currently recirculating farms using salt water, but built on land. The animal impacts I'm sure will be of interest to this audience. And you can just imagine what life in captivity in mass production means for an octopus, especially once you see my octopus teacher and you realize how rich the intertidal zone is, how incredible this environment has been for cognition. I mean, the argument is that there is no parental learning in octopuses and that in part their intelligence is a result of this very rich environment in which they live. They're capable of conscious experience and farming, especially the way that it's proposed, is completely incompatible with the welfare needed to meet their sophistication and exploration. The food security impacts, they, uh, a friend of mine, James McKinnon, has made this distinction between something being eaten versus something being consumed. And we would argue that octopuses are being consumed. They are largely being consumed in luxury markets where food security is not a concern. Therefore, whatever calories or protein they represent could be replaced easily with some other kind of equivalent caloric or protein rich food. The main importing countries are US, Canada, Italy, Spain, Portugal, and Japan. None of these are on the global hunger index. And the main markets for farmed octopus, again, overlap largely with those countries, Japan, South Korea, North Mediterranean, US, China, and Australia. And you can see this in the octopus industry literature if you want to read it. And this is talking more about the wild market, but it's the same for farmed octopus. The main drivers of the market's growth are increasing exotic meat demand, rising disposable income, the world's taste preferences are shifting, and raising awareness around the world of healthy food consumption. Do these sound like food security concerns? They sound very much to me like concerns of a luxury market. Fatty acids, trace minerals, omega-3s, high iron content for a healthy immune system. Again, this is about consuming a product, not really about eating it. So what are the nutrition facts of an octopus? Well, they're not so, so different from that of tofu. Um, admittedly, this is 135 grams of tofu, and this is about half that grammage of, of octopus. But you can see if you just eat a little more tofu, you get about the same amount of protein, about the same amount of fat, and about the same amount of calories. Um, octopus are not a wonder food. They're not, it's not particularly unique. And so there isn't any reason to accept um, an, a, a system of global octopus farm production, especially given that we haven't opted into it yet on the grounds of nutrition alone. In 2019, we also followed up with an open letter in animal sentience as a response to Jennifer Mather's piece on octopus personality and intelligence, arguing that um, her work was groundbreaking, really important for illuminating some of these features in, um, in cognition in octopus, and that these features should then also have an ethical dimension or an ethical consequence. And that consequence should at the very minimum be that we do not subject them to a life of mass production. And that was the primary argument, not that we shouldn't eat octopus, that's a separate argument, but that we should not farm them. And we had over 100 uh, academics that we, we only opened it up for academics uh, sign this open letter in animal sentience. Between that article and the, the first one, the case against octopus farming, we did find a lot of media interest in the story and uh, reporters who wanted to cover the issue and did. 
But I want to note the way that octopuses are represented visually in these stories. So here's one at National Geographic about the world wanting to eat more octopus. Is farming them ethical? But rather than showing them being farmed, they show this beautiful, free range, wild octopus on a beautiful, pristine reef. That was a pretty common type of image. You can see the Guardian study in the, in the, or the Guardian coverage in the lower left corner. Time Magazine did a little bit better with actually showing an octopus being, um, one presumes, uh, caught or maybe about to be slaughtered in an octopus farm in the Yucatan Peninsula. But I still don't think any of these images really represent what mass production will look like for an octopus. So we commissioned artists um, who use really neat dystopian algorithmic approach to art to create this image of a potential octopus farm. Um, again, right now all, exper all octopus farming is experimental. So what does it look like once we have the system down? And perhaps this is more the imagery that we can expect from industrial production at least based on what we've seen has happened for cows, pigs, and chickens. It has been wonderful to see Compassion and World Farming take up the issue of octopus factory farming. As of last year, a great report on how it's a recipe for disaster and um, opposition to, um, to octopus farming uh, in, in the EU context. It was also really wonderful to see the report out earlier this year from um, from a team of researchers at the London School of Economics, including including Heather Browning, talking about um, how octopuses should be considered um, sentient animals. Now, again, the question is what that means for policy. And in the face of all of this new science, in the face of knowing what we know about octopuses, their personalities, their cognition, their sentience, we are still allowing this farm, Nueva Pescanova, is funding with 50 million euros to go forward to produce 3,000 tons of octopus per year in Spain. Some of our recent work has also asked, you know, how, do, how does this farming get off the ground to begin with? Again, the research has been um, supported by uh, by governments, really, especially by the European Commission. So in this study, which we haven't published yet, we used the web of science to examine 218 papers on octopus aquaculture production and looked at who was acknowledged in the funding um, and in the acknowledgments of the paper and found that governments are by far the biggest funders, especially the European Commission, as well as Spain, Mexico, and Chile in getting octopus farming off the ground. So without tax dollar support, without support really of citizens, um, octopus farming would not be a viable activity. And these subsidies have made a big difference to, to this industry. Now the question is, if we can make the technology work and we can get the octopuses to reproduce in captivity and to, um, and to eat well and to grow well, and we can get the government subsidies in place, then what's holding us back from octopus farming? And the answer is the only thing that can hold us back is our moral concern, is banding together to say that this is not the right decision to make in the 21st century. So octopuses are really at a crossroads right now. And I think their fate is very illuminating for how we will see uh, the, the increased pressure on aquatic animals generally to be put, put into a system of domestication and mass production. And um, I hope today that um, many of you will be interested in joining us as we say no um, uh, to octopus farming and we continue to try to um, support the efforts of NGOs, activists, schol and scholars who are opposed to octopus farming, um, both in Spain and beyond. Thank you for your attention. Hello everyone. Thank you very much to the organizers for inviting me to talk about welfare challenges 
in the sustainable use of animals and fisheries and aquaculture. So I'm going to talk about the blue economy, which I'm sure all of you have heard about, which is the use of marine resources in terms of industry and making money and how sustainability underpins this. I'll also talk about the use of marine protected areas uh, as a means of increasing sustainability. And then I'll briefly describe some fishing techniques which make sustainability quite challenging. And then of course, in response to our growing populations and our need for protein, there is an increasing reliance on the farming of aquatic animals. And then I hope to leave you in a positive state by discussing what we can think about for the future. Well, if we, for those of you who are not familiar with the blue economy, if we think about it, um, we're really thinking about how we can make money out of marine resources. Of course, so the EU says that we need to do this responsibly. And here in Sweden, where I'm based, where they're very environmentally um, tuned into issues um, again it's really industries that are based on the sea and the water and, and, and aquaculture is predicted to grow very much in the future to meet the demands of our growing populations for protein and this talk really concerns the use of animals which you could call seafood and this is the top 10 companies companies in these sectors and so you can see that seafood as part of the blue economy is hugely valuable it's 2000 sorry 276 billion dollars and when we're thinking about blue economy we're thinking about this idea of sustainability and how do we achieve that well one way is through ensuring the diversity of species within the marine environment of course if you're actually fishing those animals that's rather a challenge. And then we're thinking about clean and healthy oceans. Really, we should be ensuring that the ecosystem is healthy, that it can support animal life, especially if we want to have sustainable populations to catch in the future. And this infographic um, explains the kind of ideals behind the blue economy that it's inclusive and improves the lives of all humans, that it creates jobs and reduces poverty and hunger. Um, and that is a wonderful ideal, but in practice, does that actually work? Because there's two issues here. For example, is based on sustainable fisheries. So this means that we can't really go out and catch all of the fish in our seas. We have to do it in a manner that allows recruitment and new animals to the next generation. And also that we should conserve marine life and the oceans, but are we actually doing that? Well, this is the uh, opinion of the Blue Marine Foundation. And it's basically tells us that our oceans are in crisis, that we are overfishing because we're taking so many animals from the environment and that's having really significant consequences and reducing biodiversity. To combat this, many countries have created marine protected areas or MPAs. And the whole idea of those is that these areas are safeguarded and that they're protected, whereby the animals there can reproduce and live healthy lives and the ecosystem is kept in pristine conditions so that we have animals contributing to the wider populations. I'm sure you'll be quite shocked to find out that actually fishing in marine protected areas is allowed. And this is an example from the UK government where they basically talk about how they manage fishing in these areas. Now, to me, a marine protected area really should be a no catch zone. It should be totally untouched, but that's not really the case around the world. What kind of fishing methods are used? Many of these are destructive in nature. So for example, demersal or bottom troll trawling, which really targets flatfish and other species which live at this, the bottom of the ocean. And this net is dragged along and it effectively scours the environment and catches many, many different species. We also have long lines which use bait 
so it uses animals to catch animals i don't really see that that fits with the idea of sustainability we have gill nets which um obviously catch fish but also other species we then have these massive purse sounds which catch huge numbers of animals and effectively purse them up we have pole and line which is a classic rod and line approach and this usually tends to be for species that are large like tuna and then we have dredging which actually uh, again is very disturbing on the environment tends to um, catch seafood which or animals that live at the bottom of the ocean we have pots and traps and we also have these pelagic trawls which can pick out huge populations of pelagic midwater species so these trawlers have been developed into real in huge industrial machines where they are massively long nets and we can see this here, um, really catching massive amounts of fish. And you'll be pretty shocked to know that it was found that they fish in 39 different marine protected areas. They spend 3,000 hours fishing. And in this case, it was found that there was the death of 1,000 porpoises that were caught in the nets. And of course, these are not the target species. But when you throw a big net like this into the environment, it's going to catch everything in its way. And here is a, an example of um, beam trawling. So beam trawling is basically dragging this giant net on the seabed and lifts and scours all of the environment and takes everything in its wake. It's really quite a destructive method of catching fish. And in European waters, it's used a lot. And it tends to catch flatfish. And it scours the bottom. It leaves these tracks. And you can actually have a look at these. Um, this is the Southern Baltic Sea. And you can see there's huge masses of destruction to the environment. So one has to ask the question, is this a healthy, clean environment? Is it a healthy ecosystem? Are we maintaining biodiversity in, in the wake of this trawl? And I think really the answer is no. Now let's turn our attention to the individual animal. It's well known that scientific evidence shows that fishes, cephalopods, decapod crustaceans and other aquatic animals can experience pain and so suffer when they're damaged. And they also experience fear, distress, and various other negative aspects of, of welfare. And fisheries effectively catch a huge number of animals in, in a large net. So we're capturing these animals, we're taking them out of the water so they're suffocating, they can't breathe, they're crushed under the weight of each other. And then we're taking them on board a ship where in effect, it's very difficult to um, humanely kill these animals. And a, a recent campaign by L214 has targeted the impacts of benthic trawling. And if you want to see more about that, please do go to the website. Now, I'm going to show you some upsetting images um, of animals in trawls. So I ask that you um, please don't look if you are easily upset or offended by this type of, of thing. But this is the reality of catching fish. This is how we do it. And what you can see here, these are flat fishes. They are absolutely crushed under their weight. Um, they are and it, been dragged out of the water, crushed in this net. Also, many other species are caught. So we can see um, a shark species, other species of fish, a squid. And they're left to effectively suffocate and die on board the ship. And these are what are called bycatch. These are the animals that you don't want. The troll is targeting flat fishes, but we catch everything in its wake. And in effect, I would say, in my opinion, this is inhumane. Further, the animals that are taken for food, it is very difficult to humanely kill them. You have to 
basically stun them prior to this. And there are not many boats that have stunning equipment aboard, although this is changing. However, in some cases, fish are gutted alive. And of course, this would be very painful. So is this practice sustainable? We are overfishing, there's no doubt about that. And our po the populations of the fishes that we eat and other animals are declining. And it's estimated that it's something like a trillion fish are caught per year. We also use fish as bait to catch other fish. How is that sustainable? We catch many species that we don't want. So really we need to think about ways of improving their welfare, getting them back into the sea while they're still alive, or incorporating them as part of the catch. And so we broaden the way that we eat fish. We should also be using gears that don't destroy the ecosystem. This is not fundamental to what the thinking is behind the blue economy. We should be using non-destructive ways of catching fish. And if we think about the welfare of these fishes, you know, if they are released, um, some of them are too small or if they're bycatch, we should be capturing them in a better way and also killing them in a, a humane way. Another problem, of course, is ghost gear or um, fishing gear that has be basically been discarded in the oceans. And this then affects other species that get tangled up in it. And that can, can cause a significant mortality and injuries to other species. So we're overfishing. What do we do? Well, industry has responded to this by providing a solution, which is aquaculture farm fishes and other aquatic animals. Of course, we still need a sustainable way of doing this. We still need to maintain a healthy ecosystem. And I would argue we also still have to think about the health and welfare of the animals. There are many different ways to farm fish. Um, here, this is an example of a sea cage where fish are held inside these cages in the open ocean or in, in fjords or in near the coast. Or the other alternative is farming on land in these tanks, which are completely artificial to the normal environment. But then, of course, there is no effect on the external environment as there is with open sea cages. This is an example from Maine, and there are big three for aquaculture and mussels, oysters, and of course, salmon. And one of the things you can notice is there's a lot of chemicals and food going into the system and then there's a lot of waste produced which is going into the environment and so there's many risks with sea cage aqu aquaculture for example we catch fish to feed fish in, in farms we effectively catch many fish from the environment to grow fish so there is an increased pressure to fish this particular study in Finland showed that we catch many capelin fish to feed farmed salmon. The result of that is that wild salmon don't have so many prey animals to eat, so they are smaller in the wild. Also, when these animals migrate to sea, some fishers are using smaller mesh nets. That means they're catching salmon. And so only very small salmon get to migrate to the ocean. So both of those things, both those practices are resulting in much smaller salmon. And we're driving that evolution of that through fishing. Other uh, risks, of course, is that um, we often farm non-native species. And if they escape, that can affect the environment and the native species. We use a variety of chemicals which are expelled into the environment. We use herbicides to control algal growth on the cages. The animals are held in very high stocking densities, so there's a high transmission of disease, and this can result in new diseases or parasites to the environment. Many of the farm species can be genetically modified, and of course they can escape and affect wild populations. And then, of course, what goes in must come out. So we have um, fish waste or sewage, which is very harmful to the environment and to wild species. And finally, we have a conflict with wild predators. For example, in Scotland, many seals see the salmon cages as a buffet 
and so they want to eat the fish and 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 they will try and do that of course the farmers don't want that and so they want to shoot seals so we have that conflict there the alternative to farming and the environment and having aquaculture systems that affect the environment is to have them wholly indoors and we've seen the rise of recirculating aquaculture systems called RAS systems and in this case they're held indoors and then very little water is used and it's recycled. So it's felt that that's more sustainable because we're not taking um, any water from the environment. However, there is lots of things going on in the system. There is light control, temperature control pumps to pass the water through filtration. And so a high amount of energy is used to maintain water quality. The risk with these, of course, is that if water quality is affected in any way, this is a significant stressor to the fish. So if something goes wrong, this can result in the fish becoming stressed, which might lead to disease and mortality. And of course, we still need to feed these fish in these systems. And so we're still catching fish from the wild to feed them. So thinking about the welfare of fish in aquaculture, we 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 can see that the captive environment does not resemble the natural environment. We keep the animals in unnaturally high stocking density, so many animals in a small space. We often see high mortality in juvenile stages in the young. The animals are vaccinated to protect them against diseases, but of course, this is a very stressful event, and so we see high mortality. Many of the species are territorial and aggressive. And so we have to solve that problem by taking the largest animals out of the tanks regularly. But of course, any subordinate animals may receive injuries from dominant animals. And then we have the issue of humane slaughter. How do we stun the animals and render them unconscious before um, killing them so that they have a good death? And I must say, all of this has been tackled by welfare scientists, so there is hope, but these are still significant issues. If we think about the individual animal and think about the terrestrial farm species, the animals that we farm on land, what are the ideal characteristics? Well, one of them is that we farm animals that don't compete with humans for food, so we tend to farm animals like chickens, sheep, cows, which are omnivores or herbivores. And they, we don't eat the same food as them, so they don't compete with us. However, we're actually farming a lot of predatory aquatic animals. So 27% of fish that are caught at sea go to fish meal for, for feeding farmed animals. That's 20 million tonnes. 90% of these fish could be eaten by us, by humans. And it takes 1.15 kilograms of cotfish to produce one kilogram of salmon. That's not sustainable, really. And so many studies have now looked at replacing fish meal with animals or uh, organisms that we don't eat. So they're not competing for the same food as us. So for example, in rainbow trout, mealworms have had some success white shrimp, it's proteins from microbes, and European sea bass, it's algae. And we can reduce the fish content of their food, but be, be aware that science must confirm that there's no ill health from replacing the food. Or we could just farm herbivorous fish or aquatic animals. So for example, the animals with a, a blue area, they are fed fish meal, whereas tilapia, catfishes, carps and milkfish, they're herbivorous fish and they don't require fish meals, why not farm them? And this idea of using um, animals which are, are amenable to aquaculture has been really promoted by the Fish Ethel Group and Joanne Sereva and colleagues. And really we need to know more about the natural behavior and life history of the animals that we seek to farm so that we choose animals that are good and can have good welfare in aquaculture systems. There is an ethical debate currently about farming octopus with 
farmers arguing it's more sustainable to, to farm them than catch them from the wild, whereas scientists, of course, make the case that these are intelligent beings, they are solitary and aggressive in nature, and they eat other animals, so they compete with us for food. So really, at this point, there is a campaign to prevent octopus farming. So what's the future? Well, I think really we need to incorporate thinking about welfare of the animals at the individual level to really boost sustainability, to produce healthy populations of animals and to ensure biodiversity. And so this, by improving the welfare of fish caught or other animals caught in fisheries, we can increase sustainability, we can increase the health of populations, and we should really be thinking about managing them better. I think we really need to stop overfishing. And one of the ways that we can do that is have mar marine protected areas that are actually protected with no fishing. In terms of aquaculture, we really have to replace fish meal. We can't keep catching fish to feed fish. And many studies are looking at this. And we also need to choose species to farm that can have good welfare under captive conditions. Now, many of you might be thinking, why don't we just stop fishing? Why don't we stop eating fish? Why don't we stop farming them? But of course, I live in current times where many, many people rely on fish for industry or for their income or for food. So whatever your take on this is, I hope I've given you some ideas and that you can act now and petition politicians and join in with charities and NGOs to try and promote a more sustainable use of animals in the marine environment and in freshwater environments. Thank you very much for your attention. If you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Please email me or contact me on Twitter. Take care, bye.